my question right now, the next one would be, so at the moment, definitely, like you mentioned, we have um, an evolution between web two and three, but the challenge has been, how can we define decentralization when the world is coming to more centralized systems? If you if you look even um, the paradox of ChatGPT, ChatGPT started with OpenAI, the foundation, and they oh, well, there's a foundation, and it became a very corporate company owned by Microsoft. Uh, in general, at least the majority invested by Microsoft. So it's a paradox of what was meant to do. So, uh, and when you look at uh, the protocols that were built by Gavin Woodson, all, all you guys in Polkadot and all different things, the challenge right now is that there's the, so first of all, there's the evolution of what we, we mean, even beginning of the internet was supposed to be as well, much more scientific. Actually, the internet started initially as a military experience and then, then an academic experience. But the challenge is, how can we build this internet that looks at the physical and the digital and all the immersive parts? Because, of course, uh, part of the Web3 um, definition, what you put it, is the ID system of the internet. But as well, the immersive part of the internet, especially right now with uh, the concept of metaverse and incre increasing AI that sums all the different technologies. So how... Is your personal vision and as well the foundation i don't know if there's, there's differences but i'm sure there's similarities how can we look at especially the concept of decentralization because it's i think probably the biggest elephant in the room in one end there's a lot of great work and the same the same with cryptocurrencies at the moment we have a massive discussion worldwide about this uh, um, fight against cryptocurrency especially from the us government but at the same time people don't even know about it and, and uh, people keep using it it will not stop it just uh, how we do it. So, but I, I think the concept of decentralization, I would like to touch that in particular because I know that is kind of very important for you guys and you are experts as well in this area. Right. I mean, I would I would argue that uh, decentralization is sort of you know the, the sine qua non, right, of, of blockchain. If you don't have decentralization, you may it doesn't matter what data type you use to store the data, it, uh, you know, which is all blockchain is, it's a particular type of data structure. Uh, you know, if, if you don't have decentralization, then what's the point, right? And this also is, is very interesting to me personally, because uh, it touches on the, like my, actually my two college majors. I was a dual major in computer science and political science. So I'm gonna put on my political science major hat for a moment. Uh, and and discuss it from that perspective, right? So it turns out like there's always a, a tension, right? In, in any political system between centralization and decentralization, uh, right? So we see, you know, in, in some cases, right? We have, you know, very, very centralized states, right? I think you just, uh, as an example today, you know, you can think of uh, uh, France or China, right? You know, if you go to, to, to France, you know, pretty much every school in the, uh, in, in all of France will be learning the same thing on the same day for the same grade. It's a very centralized uh, top-down system. I live in Switzerland right now, which is very federal. Uh, you know, my wife worked in the next canton, the next state, and she had an entirely different uh, holiday schedule than me because they, they celebrate different holidays. They do things different. The rules vary. Uh, you know, it's a very, very decentralized state. And uh, you know, and then there are a lot of states, you know, you know, in between and in different extremes in different ways. And and what we see is that centralized entities often can get things done much more quickly. Uh, and they're very strong, but in the short run, right? It turns out there's there's you know, if you want to get something done, right, you get you know one person who can just make all of the rules, right? That's why, you know, in World War II, you had Eisenhower, you had one person in charge, you know, of, of the European front. Uh, you didn't have, you know, lots of people all running around each, you know, working on their own. That would not have been very efficient for that one specific goal. Uh, on the other hand, though, when you have that, that's, that's a recipe for, for tyranny and stagnation in the long run. You get a lot of stuff done, but how you how do you determine you know, what the goal is, what people want to do, uh, and also how do you determine who the rule makers will be? Right, uh, and I'm not going to name any names about you know, who might be like a, t a tyrant, right? Uh, but you know you can see that there's that possibility you know, always, right? And then once you have a tyrant, that's a recipe for stagnation. You can't change, you can't move. You just do what this person wants. Uh, on the other hand, you know, with decentralization, like that seems, you know, uh, uh, it's really great. You can do a lot of uh, uh, things. You can decide what you're going to do, but there's never going to be 100% of the people in favor of doing something. And so, 
you know, we see also you know in, in blockchain technology we see this you know some have some blockchains have you know a very very uh you know, like a rigid uh, uh setup it's very difficult to change you know, like like bitcoin you have others where you have a single person in uh in charge who can really make the decisions uh you have some where there's you know like lots of people all making decisions and, and arguing um so all right so how how do we like as polkadot and we at web3 foundation uh you know how do how do we do, how do we make sure that our system can evolve uh and and do so in in a in a decentralized manner right so we actually have developed we spent a lot of time on this so again we have numerous researchers numerous phd's here who have developed uh, what we call polkadot open gov and that allows the community to make decisions it's um uh it, entirely democratic. There's no first class citizens uh, in, involved in, in it. What I mean by that is someone who has more power, right? There's no equivalent of, of senator, senators or House of Representatives or presidents in Polkadot. Uh, but they can make decisions that are automatically enacted by the network. And unlike other chains, you may have heard uh, of forks like you know Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash. You know they they sort of separated at some point. Ethereum and Ethereum Classic. They we call forked. Uh, we uh, our protocol does not really allow for forks, right? So we can make a decision, decide on it, have it enacted, and and move forward with it. So that allows us to be like a very you know autonomous system that's very democratic, uh, but also still very powerful. So we get a lot of the benefits, right, of uh, you know the centralized dis uh, decision making without having a centralized decision maker. So this allows us, right, to to evolve. You know, to continue to to accept input from the users of the system, but also get a lot of the benefits of a, you know a, a single direction, right? Of figuring out a way that we can all agree on, on a single uh, on a single direction. So again, this is something that it is it is challenging, right? You know, uh, it, it's not there, there is no simple answer to to how we can do it, but it's something that we've given a lot of thought to. We've developed the system, and one of the great things about Polkadot, as I mentioned, you know, it allows you to evolve. So if we determine that our current system is you know not really meeting the needs of us we actually can vote in uh you know vote in a new system vote in new ways of making rules new ways of governance uh, etc. Yeah and this is probably the most important thing we need to consider right now is, is are we going to be creating these rules and are we going to create this evolution in the most I would say ethical way but as well more coordinated way because there's a lot of uh, conflicting versions uh, like you said at the moment, there's 1.2 billion websites in the internet. Um, most majority of those websites are still Web 1, Web 2. And, uh, and at the same time, a lot of infrastructure is not prepared for Web 3. And uh, although all our phones, like you said, are already more or less prepared. So it's, it's a question of a paradox. So we're going to take this forward.